Hello, Tim Wilmot here and welcome to a slightly different video from my normal watercolour demonstrations. This time a short video on the materials I use following questions from subscribers, comments on my previous YouTube uh, videos over what paint do I use, what brushes do I use, what paper I use. So this is um, the current state of play. This is late 2018. Things have subtly changed over the years. I've changed brands, paper, brushes and so on. Um, this is late 2018. It, may, it might change over time. Who knows? Uh, nothing stands still as they say. So starting off with the paper, first of all. So the paper I use is Saunders Waterford. This is cotton based paper as opposed to wood um, based, wood pulp based paper. And if you can afford it, if your budget allows, go for the best quality materials you can afford. And that's very true with paper. Um, you will notice the difference between cotton and wood pulp, uh, wood based paper in that this cotton based paper is more absorbent you can you've got longer time to work on things and timing timing is of the essence in watercolor um, timing different effects and so on and doing wet and wet so having this sort of paper is really going to help you and make make your life easier so this is Saunders Waterford there's three different uh, textures of watercolor paper you get hot press which is really smooth then you get a uh, rough which is the um, other end of the scale and this is in the middle so this is slightly rough this is cold press or um, not it's still a little bit rough um, I quite like it in between the two now I get this paper as what are called full sheets, so separate sheets, and then I um, cut them down to size. Generally, that would be half imperial or quarter imperial. This is quarter imperial, so this is 15 inches by um, 11 inches. It comes, when you get separate sheets, it comes with a nice um, jagged edge, like a deckled edge, which is quite attractive when you, if you ever frame it, um, um, having that have that nice sort of nice sort of deckled edge and to cut the paper I'll use uh, a bread knife when I fold over the paper use um, a bread knife at a sort of 45 degree angle very gently and it sort of maintains that nice deckled edge all the way around now to secure it to the board um, I use a Corex board, it's a lightweight uh, plastic board, a bit like corrugated cardboard. I use um, masking tape, um, a little sort of border um, around the sides. I know some people use bulldog clips and other means clamps to uh, clamp their paper down. Um, I don't pre-wet the paper by the way, so um, I'll be painting straight away on this surface and just held down with that masking tape. But when the masking tape is pulled around. I get a get a sort of even edge all the way around. You get a nice sort of border around your uh, painting, which immediately sort of sets it off, and it looks um, a little bit better than going than I think painting right to the edge. So that's um, paper. Then paints. Well, I use mainly Windsor and Newton. Um, it's a brand I've, I've used for a long time. Uh, if I just grab my normal palette. So this is my normal studio palette here. And this is a, a, a Holbein metal palette. I think they're made in Japan. Um, you've got a little thumb hole there. So it can be portable. Um, stick your thumb through there supported on your lower arm uh, but I use it primarily indoors in the studio and the colors I've got here a neutral tint or Payne's gray um, then we've got burnt umber burnt sienna yellow ochre 
viridian green, cobalt green, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue. Then there's um, alloys and crimson, a Windsor red, which is a bright red, light red. Uh, we've got cadmium orange there and light yellow or lemon yellow. And then a few mixing wells. Generally, my darks will go in here, the cools in that one, and then the warms, anything reddish, brownish, whatever, will go in there. So that's my normal um, studio palette. Now, when I'm out and about doing plain air painting, I've got a little, com what's called a little compact Frank Herring um, palette, which comes like that. You just open it out and you have, again, you've got that little thumb hole there. This is a 12 pan um, set. I've actually, these top eight here, I've taken out the middle divider to give me four whopping great big um, areas for just for just for primary colors um, th uh, three three primary colors and a neutral tint so neutral tint um, that same uh, Windsor red a yellow a blue maybe one or two miscellaneous colors down here and then four mixing wells warms darks yellows or greens blues down there I have seen uh, on some of my workshops that I run, I have seen some nice modifications to this. So it, for, for example, in this area here, I've seen someone put a little sponge um, in that area there, cut down to size. Somebody else has blocked that off and they put in some more um, uh, little half pans there or full pans rather for more colors. And then put a, on the other side, they put in a little thumb hole. So nice. It's, designed to be modified um, and so I've just snipped out these middle dividers here just to give me four big areas so that's the paints um, I do also have a I do also use a white gouache for a small amount of highlighting of course with watercolor generally you're leaving the white paint showing um, so that you're painting light, light to dark and you leave the, the lighter areas unpainted. But sometimes it helps uh, with a sort of loose style of painting just to use, in, in a moderate way, a little bit of white gouache fresh from the tube um, as well, uh, just, just to highlight maybe the tops of people's heads, shoulders, tops of boats, tops of cars and so on. Uh, as regards neutral tint, um, I, I did say I'm using pr primarily Winds and Newton. I'm using Daniel Smith's neutral tint, extra fine watercolors. That's really nice. Um, I find it does blend really well with other colors and doesn't tend to bleed um, into other areas like some other neutral tints. So that's a really good um, good quality paints there as well. So that's generally Winds and Newton. Uh, also with these paints, I've got a little device a sort of tube squeezer, I'm not sure what it's called, um, this device here, which um, allows me to get, because I'm so tight, allows me to get the very last um, bit of paint out of these tubes just by turning that screw there. Um, yeah, good little device. Use it for your toothpaste as well. So that's the, um, the paints. And then brushes. Let me just get these paints out of the way. Brushes. Not a massive range of brushes. Again, these have changed over the years as you get wind of different um, different makes and manufacturers. So primarily, I'm using um, these Raphael brushes. Uh, this is called Soft Aqua and it's imitation um, squirrel. So it's a synthetic brush. You get a really good edge with these, and, and these actually work very similar. They, they have um, the effect of 
almost a natural brush as you see the way that bends there almost like um, squirrel or or some other natural hair and a nice edge to it nice point to it this is a size 8 don't go by sizes um, every manufacturer is different so that's quite a large size there the next down from that is a six I don't think they do even numbers I think it's all sorry I don't think they do odd numbers all even numbers that's number six uh, then there's a number four is that number four yeah that's number four and then number two is there and then zero is there quite a small little one there I do have a few synthetic round brushes again with fairly good points this is an Escoda Prado um, and it's got a very good point very good edge to it another similar one there um, for more detailed work then a sword brush uh, you could use a rigger but the sword brush very good for doing lines got a very good uh, retention of water there so you can pick up a lot of paint and go for a long long time without having to refill uh, very good for doing foliage as well in a sort of random way like that so that's the that's a sword brush or dagger brush but you could use a rigger now I do have this brush here there's another one somewhere a medium-sized mop brush for doing foliage so these brushes are I've had them many many years and what I've done is so I've when they've lost their point and you will on some of these mop brushes you will lose the point eventually um, it's inevitable so with these brushes flatten out the hairs and then with a pair of nail scissors just chop away to give myself a, a really jagged um, edge there and that's very good for doing foliage you know you can dip this in the paint get a sort of um, random effect there with foliage um, doing trees that, and, and that sort of thing um, other brushes that I use so we've got a uh, another sort of thicker synthetic brush there um, we've got a Neptune brush here as well um, this is very good for doing verticals or horizontals the, br the, the actual hairs on this are very similar to the soft aqua brush and finally um, this is an older Raphael brush this is natural hair when I want a really soft effect I might I might um, not use a synthetic go for something natural and that's that gives a very soft effect over over rough um, paper so there's the brushes oh as it guards water um, here's my water bucket it's an old decorators bucket um, holds a lot of water I find uh, I like a big sort of bucket like that then a sponge um, what can you say about a sponge? Well, apart from the, obviously it's just used for um, taking out some of the water. If I've got too much water in a brush, quickly dab it on the sponge there to to uh, take all the water away. So there's the materials I use. As I say, it could change. Um, but thanks very much for watching. Look out for my next uh, full-length watercolor demonstration with commentary. But thanks for watching and catch up with you soon. Bye bye.